All right, folks, we have a really special guest here tonight, um, Mark Christopher Lawrence, MCL, he's often called. He is a famed American actor, stand-up comedian, voiceover artist. He's appeared in a ton of movies such as Terminator 2, Tales from the Hood, The Island, The Pursuit of Happiness, over 117 acting credits counting. You probably know him best from his role as Big Mike on Chuck, which was a great show. Um, he made guest appearances on a ton of TV programs, including Heroes, My Name is Earl, Crossing Jordan, Dharma and Greg, Men Behaving Badly, Murphy Brown, which is another uh, Seinfeld tie-in, um, and also Martin. But most importantly, and why he's with us today, is he guest starred twice in, one of the, in, in some of the most well-known episodes um, of the entire Seinfeld show, The Airport and the Race. Mark Christopher, welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. Ah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. So take us back. So 1992, right? The airport episode, um, right off the heels, I believe, of your designing women appearance, which we heard you said was a tense set. Um, how, <laughs> it was. It was, how did uh, we can get back to that in a second, but how, how did the role um, come about? as the sky cap in the airport? Uh, agents sent me an audition request and, you know, I, I go over and read for the part and, and got it. <laughs> That's basically the way it works. When, when you read was like so it's, Larry it's David well the Larry? Yeah, Larry was in the room. Uh, Jerry was not in the room. Uh, other producers were in the room. And whoever wrote that episode uh, was in the room. And the director, I think, uh, might have been Ackerman. Well, we get to that. So Ackerman is Ackerman season six. Um, oh, okay. So, so it's been the other Tom Sharonis was the. Uh, was Larry the, yeah. David wrote, wrote the airport actually. So, okay. That's probably why so he, he was in there. Yeah. Yeah. So did you find out right away, um, Mark, about the role, or do you have to wait yeah. a couple? Yeah, usually with sitcom, you know, once you go to producer, it's 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 the next day or so you you know because it's probably the next episode, which would be the next week. You know, sometimes it might be a couple of weeks ahead or maybe three weeks ahead, but but usually they're casting it, you know, like a week out. So so your your stand up background with Jerry. Um, that didn't that didn't lead to the role then you got that you kind of just got it outside of that or did, did the jerry connection happen no. after the show no uh him for a little bit at one point or no for jerry what, what was did I, you I open for jerry um and stand up no jerry um was working at a club that there used to be a club in newport beach california called um the laugh stop and so uh early in my career that was one of my one of my sort of home clubs where where I hosted a lot. And so Jerry did a weekend there and I hosted the weekend. Was that prior to being on the show though or after? Yeah, that was way before. The way show. before, got it, got it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I was even uh, acting then. I, I, um, I started comedy in, in, the eighth, in the 11th grade. <laughs> wow, nice. Yeah. So that, that's really your, ba that's, that was your bread and that was, you know, where you got your start then obviously. No, nah, no, not really. I'm, you know, it's like I, I didn't get serious about comedy until after college. Got it. You know, it's like I started, I started doing it back then, and and you know, paying my dues. But then what what happened was um, I went to USC on a debate scholarship, and you know, while I was there, I just went the acting program and got in, and and then uh, started work professionally as an actor uh, that same year, and then. When I graduated, I went to San Francisco and did a show with the San Francisco Mime Troupe that, you know, they, they sort of do guerrilla theater style uh, of Commedia dell'arte and came home. And it wasn't until after that, it's like all of a sudden I didn't have any work. And, and, and I was, I was at that point, I was already working almost monthly, you know, as an actor in film and television, something would come up every month. And and uh, when I got back from San Francisco, all of a sudden I didn't have anything to do. It was like I was, it was, it had slowed down. So I went back to the Bay Area and got into the San Francisco comedy comp competition and ended up in 
semifinals with really no act. And so I was like, okay, I can make this work. And then I went home and, and got serious about comedy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing that the big shirt. So that was 88. I'm guessing having that debate background helps with stand up, being on stage, being able to talk, being able to kind of think fast, things like that. It it definitely kills the the fear. Right. You know, because especially cause the fear early, of hecklers, you're, you're going right back at them. If you could debate, you're going right back at them. I don't even worry about hecklers. <laughs> hecklers, you know, hecklers show up. You you bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> um, so, I, I think. The, the, the biggest fear is, is, you know, am I going to be funny? But, but I don't think of it that way. I just go out and tell them, here's some information that you need. <laughs> Got it. So fast forward, obviously, you had some success with the comedy, and, and then now you're kind of weaving yourself into the acting circuit. So 1992, like I said, you did a design in women. You've done a, a couple, like, well, sit well, see, here, here's, here's the thing. Uh, you're probably looking at IMDb for credits. Yeah. So IMDb is not complete. You know, I started working professionally as an actor in 86. So, really? so there, yeah, there, there's things that, that aren't on IMDb because the producers maybe died before IMDb, oh, before inter, the internet happened. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that I did before IMDb ever existed. Interesting. I just, you know, you're such, I feel like you're such a young guy and this is, we're going back like 30 years as is, you know. Um, I've, been, I've been a professional actor for, for 35 years. Wow. I'm 50, I'm 56. I'll be 57 next month. Well, in, in May. Awesome. Well, you look great, Mark. Black don't crack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So the airport, like for me personally, like one of my favorite oh, episodes. I ranked that in the top 20. I had top it, 20 hands I had, down. It landed in the top 50 for us total, like somewhere at 45. Range. It's so funny to me. But but my part is not really funny to me. The funny part to me is George standing there with that with that, that magazine going, there's a blurb about me in here. <laughs> <laughs> You're a blurb. <laughs> yeah. It's it's the most well-rounded show. And it's it was an interesting show. It's one of the few episodes, right, where there's no scenes at the coffee shop or Jerry's apartment, right? But right. Again, like Mark, when I talk about this show, like you get brought up all the time. Like oh, two beans. The JFK Honolulu line, and it just, it gets me every time. So it's like, it's interesting. You have a, such a small part, but like, you really shined and brought out such a great dynamic in Jerry and Elaine. Can you kind of talk about that scene a little bit? Um, you know, it was, it was very fast. It's like they shot it at the end of the, end of the night. Um, if you're at, uh, if you've ever been to CBS Radford, uh, as soon as you come through the gate on the left, there's a building right there. And uh, as you walk past that building, if you look to the left, you'll see that gray wall where we were standing. So, so they were trying to figure out where to shoot this thing. And then uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the, ah, jump the director? help me for a second. Set the record? Uh, no, the, the, um, why is, am I drawing a blank? Producer? The guy who used the camera. He's the camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> the camera director operator. Photography. Yeah, the director the of photography yeah. uh, you know, on a quick break went out and went, hey, we could shoot it over there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's where they shot it. They just set up like a, a little counter and it was quick. So, I mean, that was 92 season four. So the show was like, like humming, right? Like, you knew you knew what a big opportunity this was, and kind of how did that kind of do people reckon people still recognize you to this day about that episode? I'm assuming, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. And, and and always like around Christmas time, the other episode that I did. Right. So I want we want to touch on that a little bit. So you 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 nail the season four episode, and then they bring you back in season six. Um, as as the, uh, the the mall uh, operator, that, you know Kramer's boss there. Right. T- take us through how that how that happened. Where they you know. Well, no, no. What year was that? The ninety six the the season six episode. Yeah. Two years later, ninety four. Oh, ninety four. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it was basically another audition, and you know I go in and read and get the job and. And go there, and and that's that's the one where Kramer comes comes down the 
No, no, I'm, I'm mixing up the two episodes. Kramer comes down the the the, the baggage chute in the airport. Yeah, in the airport, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was he was all neurotic, man. He was asking me, "Hey, should I come down head first or feet first? I'm like, dude, you you're one of the leads in the show. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> like, yeah, me. <laughs> so, Mark, you you were so you're. I know you just did like a quick set, but are you you're there for the full episode and like you're kind of engaging with these guys the whole time, like? Um, see, normally when you shoot in front of an audience, you're there. You're you're there all day, every day. Hmm. Um, but we didn't shoot in front of an audience in that episode. Oh right, because it was all uh, none of it was in like um, the stage, I guess. Right, there was no. Yeah, the, the the baggage thing was in was on the stage, but there was no audience. It was really right. it was really odd that you know because that was the first time I'd ever shot sitcom without an audience, so it was a little odd for me. But but it was still fun. It was fun to do. Um, but to get back to the other one, um, yeah, I just had the audition, and and I think it was one of those times where. I didn't feel like it went well, <laughs> so so I went shopping. I wasn't in this bad habit of if 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 I didn't do well at the audition, I'd run out and go shopping. And I was like, well, why? This is stupid. Why am I shopping? I didn't get the job. <laughs> I got no money. <laughs> and and so uh, when I got home, uh, there was a, a page from my agents. We had pages back then still. Mm. <laughs> my agents, uh, I called them up and I said, hey, so uh, you're working next week? I was like, oh, cool. So I guess it worked out. So same deal. Was that with, was Larry, Larry and Jerry at that audition? And like, they obviously remembered you and, and brought you back for a reason, right? Jerry wasn't there. Larry was. Larry was. Jerry wasn't, wasn't in, involved really in the, in the casting part of it. Hmm. Yeah, it was interesting yeah. they even have you. I was, I was gonna. I thought maybe they didn't even have you read. They just liked what you did in, in season four, and 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 you you had you played the same type, not type, but you you get mad in both of them. And I think that there was a humor in you getting mad. I don't know what it was, but I I like I said, said, we laugh every time. JFK Honolulu, just the look you give, the way you say it, it's one line, but it's great. Yeah. And then you know, in in the the one where you're yelling at Kramer, same thing. When you get mad, it's funny. Yeah, maybe they just saw that and knew that that character, you know, gets mad and he's funny. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. I mean, when I look at it, you know, I definitely see two different mads. You know, they 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 man the mad manifests its, itself differently in both episodes, which is really good. Mm. Jerry, uh, a couple of years later, I was in New York, and I was having lunch with Diane White. She used to be the artistic, uh, the producing director at the Los Angeles Theater Center, and we're sitting in the Village, at this little outside table, and across the street, I hear, "Hey, get your skinny ass out of here!" <laughs> and I look up, and it's Jerry, <laughs> and she goes. Who is that idiot? <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. I said, that's Jerry Seinfeld. She goes, oh, what's wrong with him? And then, then he keeps walking. It's really funny. He, he, wrote the, he wrote the line, so there you go. <laughs> so, it's interesting. You, the dynamic of season four and season six, could you, could you feel a difference? I, I know Tom Sharonis, he was the director for season four. <laughs> And then you mentioned Andy Ackerman for season six. Was we we felt a little bit of that dynamic shift when when watching season six and on. Did you sense that at all, or was it? Um, well, I, I guess I guess it depends on what you mean by dynamic shift. Well, okay, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's definitely a difference in the tone of the show after Tom Sharonis leaves. Mm -hmm. The tone of the whole entire show changes. Uh, well, Larry show is still there, but the tone a little bit shifts as far as the characters and, and the stories and just kind of the, uh, maybe I could touch on a little bit, but that's our feeling. So we just thought it, on set, it's palpable that there's a difference. But what, well, you got to you gotta bring into play that the show for the first two seasons was dead last in the ratings. It wasn't winning ratings at all. It was the first, it was the last show that Hollywood really let it find its audience. So it was it was right. dead last in the ratings for two years. They changed the format of the show after that second season because remember um, during during when the show started, he would do stand up in the beginning, and then between each segment of the show. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then the after that second up. season, they went to just bookend at the beginning and at the end. Right. And I think that helped the show immensely because now all of a sudden you, 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 you don't have that sort of break in the action and the show 
was able to just flow uh, really well without having having the stand up to set up each thing. It just works better, and I think yeah, that's, that's part of that's part of the 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 dynamic shift that that helped the show. Also, every time every time you know you you work on a show, every time you you, you do a new episode, it shifts a little. You know, you know, from being series regular on several shows, it's it's you know, let's say they bring in a new director, it's going to shift because that director has sort of a different spin on what everybody else has been doing. Right, right. right. That's that's what we're getting at. So, what's that spin? Yeah. What is Ackerman's spin different than Sharona's spin? That it's uh, from your perspective. You're on the set for both. I mean, you know, one episode, but it had, you know, is there anything yeah. that you could? It was only thirty years ago, Mark. <laughs> 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 30 years ago, what episode? Lay it on us. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I I, I don't. I, I know um, the the second episode, the audience was there, and so that that gave it a different energy. When the audience is there, you kind of when you're playing the show, you're kind of feeding off that audience and energy as well. And so that you know that's probably one of the biggest differences in those two episodes. Yeah, and I think, like, the beauty of, of Seinfeld is, like, the four main characters are great, but yeah. the way they made guest stars like you shine, honestly, and, and become memorable is, like, you know, I think about other, like, sitcoms. I don't remember who was a guest star on Cheers and Murphy yeah. Brown. Like, well, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's one of those things where, where they were really generous in that way. Because um, I remember doing a show, and I go to the I, I go to the audition in front of producers, and I'm killing it. It's really funny at the audition, and I knew I had the job, so I, I immediately went straight home and checked my machine. And sure enough, I had the job. And then uh, as we rehearsed all week, it was funny. And then the the crew came in on uh, the day before tape day to do camera blocking, and the crew was dying and then the star of the show stormed off the set and uh the director comes to me and he says mark what if what if the guy was just uh a nice guy as opposed to a funny guy perhaps the scene will be funnier overall for our star and i was like i get it it's not my show <laughs> and you know so i had to pull back on the comedy that's what's wrong with television, man. That's what's wrong. See, if I had my own show, I would want everybody that came through the door to be funny. Yeah, funny is the goal, it, man. It lightens the load. It's like it's like okay, if everybody else is funny, if I'm having a bad day, the show is still gonna work. Yeah, you know, that's fair. And and, and 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 they were really generous in that way. It's like when you watch those episodes, everybody is hilarious. Yeah, you had Mickey. Mickey was in your episode uh, in your oh, yeah. scene, and he's another. He's a you know he's a he's a secondary character. I mean, he's recurring, I suppose. But yeah, Danny's you know, a good dude. Yeah, um, the um, you know you touched on something earlier. I, I don't know how we kind of glossed over, but you know you said you started stand up in the eleventh grade. Yeah. Uh, that was just kind of on a on a whim type thing. Like, how does that? <laughs> you're in the clubs doing your thing. Is uh, was that sixteen years old? Seventeen years old? Yeah, I had a I had an English teacher that got me involved in speech and debate, and and one of the speeches that I did was um, an oral interpretation of of Staggerly. and so she introduced me to this guy Perry Brents, who sort of mentored me with this speech. He helped coach me because he had played he had done this speech when he was in in high school, and it had a bunch of characters in it, and so I played, you know, I did all the characters in this in this ten minute excerpt, and so he was producing comedy shows at USC. Uh, he was doing a thing called Evening of Soul. And he uh, said to me, you know, you, you should think about doing stand-up comedy. So then my friend Lennon, who was my best friend, uh, when we started doing like this team sort of thing, but then he was like, hey, you should lose the friend. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, well, you know, no, he's funny. And so we stuck together as long as we could. And then when I got to college, we sort of split. But but once he put me on stage for Evening of Soul, then it was like, okay, I, I need to go and see if I'm funny at a club. Mm. 
And so Lennon said, all right, let's go to the comedy store. So I went to the comedy store and did three minutes, really without an act. And, and it was funny. And Louis Anderson said, hey, you got something, kid. Keep writing. That's and that awesome. was the beginning of it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, I mean, your, your acting career, you worked with, um, you know, you worked with um, James Cameron, and Michael Bay, some of these, you know, these are big time Hollywood, big budget, you know, oh, yeah. blockbuster type movies. Um, and then, you know, I'm just curious, because those are two big names, you know, two high level directors. And then, you, you know, with Seinfeld, we look at Larry David as, as obviously a comedic genius and uh, showrunner. Um, anything you learned on the sets of maybe with those three guys that, that there was different or the same or any comparisons you can make? I know they're completely different genres, but, um, yeah. you know, they're kind of big names in those worlds. Well, well, I think, I think, you know, in film, you know, I think it's, it's important that the director really knows what he wants to see. And James Cameron was the epitome of that. It's like, he, he knew exactly what he wanted to see. In fact, when I did Terminator 2, I was only supposed to work three days. And, you know, they said really two days, but it might bleed over into three. So we're going to hire you for a week. And I ended up working six weeks. And oh, wow. because James would come to me and go, hey, what would you say right here? And I'd say something. He'd go, yeah, yeah, come on. And, and so he liked me. So I ended up, you know, there for six weeks. But because he was so meticulous and, and, and knew exactly what he wanted to see, I think that's what makes that, that movie so great. And, and Michael Bay is the same way. He knows what he wants to see. He knows what that shot is before he hits the set. He's not getting there and, and, and figuring it out. It's like, I've been on productions where the director <laughs> hadn't really done his homework. And it's like, <laughs> so he's figuring it out while you were on set. And it's like, well, this doesn't really kind of work. But, but then when you look at TV, you know, I've worked with some big names in TV. You know, Terry Hughes I've worked with. Mm. Uh, he directed the George Lynch show, which I was a series regular on. And Terry was very good with the camera. I mean, he was very good with knowing what he wanted to see from the camera, but he had no idea how to talk to actors in a way to make to make things sort of make sense. Like, like there was a scene where I'm mad at George and I come in. It was the George Lynch show. Mm. I come in and George is over there by the office. And, and as soon as I come through the little gate, you know, I'm headed toward George. He says, Mark, um, why don't you stop at the at the, the water cooler and talk to Finney, which is Brian Doyle Murray. He says, and, uh, talk to, and talk to him. I said, well, I don't have a line with him. He goes, well, 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 just cross to there and then maybe do your line from there to George. I said, well, my character is pissed. I said, if I come into the, to the office, I'm going to go right to the guy. I'm not right. going to detour. And when and, and so you know clearly he's the director, so he won. And when you see the episode, there's a hiccup in the comedy because we're so far apart that you have to rack the camera to to get the whole joke. So you miss the joke if it was tighter. Stuff that played in front of the audience didn't play on film because there's that hiccup of him cutting from me to George's reaction as opposed to being there and bam, it's right there. And uh, I think Robbie, Robbie Benson, I don't know if you guys remember him, but he, he used to be an actor and, and, and he started directing. He directed one of the episodes of the George Lynch show. And I think his episode was the best episode. It, it, it just, just from the standpoint of it moved seamlessly, um, not just visually, but the action moved seamlessly. And it's because he understood actors because he used to be an actor. Right. Interesting. So, well, from one George to another, it's funny that the one character you didn't have a scene with was George Costanza in Seinfeld. But I'm just, I'm curious, getting back to Seinfeld. Um, yeah. Were you, a, like you said, it looks like you, you have a good history of the show, right? From season two. Oh, I love the show. What was like, what, did, what are some of your favorite episodes? Just curious. And well, did you I'm ever... Gonna... I'm not a nerd like that. <laughs> I remember the names of that. <laughs> hey, wait a minute here. <laughs> we did 50 podcasts on every episode here. Come on. <laughs> I, you I can say I, like the puffy shirt, you know, scenes yeah, like I that. I'll tell you my, my, my favorite, my favorite cassette, Costanza one 
was the one where he goes cheap on on buying the announcement envelopes and and his fiance dies. Okay. And then he's and, and then he's trying and then he's trying to get like the 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 uh, death certificate so he can get a cheap flight. I was like that was hilarious to me. And then, <laughs> and, then the, and then the exploding the exploding uh wallet that was hilarious. Um there's so many, man. There's so many episodes that, that there's so many things that, that that are funny like like uh Kramer, you know, wearing other people's clothes was hilarious you know it's like it's, just, it's always something that's funny and know? was it was it that funny on set so I'm, I'm assuming you were there for i guess like a week of taping is that typically how it goes in the second one i was there for the whole week because you right. rehearse you rehearse and rehearse and then uh the script kind of changes every night until camera camera block day um so- the the first one uh, i think i was only there a couple of nights and then I was out. And we've heard it's pretty business-like, if you will. Um, any stories you could share? Like, did you like grab lunch with uh, like Danny Woodburn? Like, did you hang out with anybody on set? Yeah, or... I, I knew Danny from from comedy, so hmm. from stand up. So uh, we definitely hung out a little bit on set. Yeah. And who's your favorite? Who's your favorite? Though? Jerry. Who's your favorite? Jerry, Elaine, or, or George, or Kramer? Sorry. Who, who do I like to watch most? I, that's a tough question. Um, wow. I, I, I think I like the neuroticism of George. Hmm. But, but I love sort of Elaine's willingness to do whatever it is she needs to do to get what she wants. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's hilarious to me. I, I, I think that the thing about this show is that the characters are so clear. It's it's really um, it's really a study in in uh, TV writing uh, as far as types of characters, the way they go. You know how George is going to react to something. You know how Elaine is going to react. How Kramer, you know, you know what their type is and what's going to happen based on based on the way um, they're written. It's so clear. Um, so I like them all, man. It's hard to it's hard to choose just one. Yeah, and I think that that came through literally in that scene, right? Like Elaine's like snappiness towards you, and Jerry kind of saying, you know, relax, relax, relax. So like, yeah, that that was brought out. A, a yeah, lot. he's clearly the voice of reason. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like, yeah, that's his be... thing, exactly. The voice of reason, <laughs> even Stephen, he's very low key, yeah. very even keeled. Um, hey, five dollars a bag. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny, you mentioned um, some of the other shows you worked on. There was some like ad-libbing and the directors would kind of ask you what, what you thought about certain things. What, yeah. These TV, episodes were fully scripted, right? Like you didn't have yeah, any... T- yeah, TV, you don't have a lot of leeway because the writers like to hear what they wrote. Um, generally, what happens with me with TV is if, if I think I have a joke that works better than the joke that's written, I'll go to the director and pitch the joke to them. And then once the director hears the joke, then usually they go, "Well, let's 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 do it in front of the in front of the writers when they come in, and we'll see what happens." And ninety eight percent of the time, my joke gets in. You're a pro. <laughs> I'm a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the only other question that I have kind of is is the Larry David angle. So we talked a lot about Jerry and the other actors and stuff. Uh, I'm just curious how much Larry David was had his hands on things on the set, on the scenes you were in, if you saw him interacting at all, if he kind of just stays off of things, did he give you any lines or pointers on either of the episodes? No, no, I, I, he, I, I, don't, I don't remember him being uh, around for either of my scenes. Oh, interesting, um, okay. But when, I was, but when I was doing the George Wentz show, our stage was right across from their, from their office on, on CBS Radford lot. Oh, okay. And he'd be sitting on his balcony. And sometimes I'd go to him and I'd go, hey, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, don't worry, we'll get you back in. Oh, and, that's awesome. But, you know, it never happened. Well, it's funny because there is a lot of crossover, right? With, with some secondary characters, he brings them over to Curb. So I was just curious if you were ever interested yeah. or, or tried out for that show. Yeah, never got to read for that show, and 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 and, and I love that show. And, and in fact, Penny uh, was on that show. I, I don't know if she still is. I haven't seen it in a long time, but but she, she uh, was in a movie that we did called Fear of a Black Hat, 
and and just because of her, I wanted to go over there. Um, but but the show the show is is so funny to me because it, it it's funny in that Lucy I love Lucy kind of way. It's like you just want to tell him, hey, if you do it this way, you it's gonna be fine. But he doesn't. It's like he does the exact opposite of what of what uh, a sane person would do. <laughs> right. Exactly. Which is exactly. Crazy funny to me. So Mark, let's. I'm gonna quick take you back in time to the USC days. So wait, when, when were you in USC? What years? I was there eighty four to eighty eight. Eighty four to eighty eight. So who was your, was the big rival in debates? Same like UCLA was it the same deal as like sports. Yeah, we we crushed them all the time. Um, <laughs> we, we were we were we were uh, usually in the top three in the nation. Um, in fact, I, I went to a JC before I went to USC, and the reason I ended up at SC was that I won the national tournament. I took four events to the tournament and won all four events. So then when I got to SC, the reason they recruited me was because they didn't have an individual event squad. They had one guy doing all individual events. So I recruited some other guys, and they were not winning every tournament, even though they would win one, two, and three. They would sweep both sides of the debate. And they wouldn't win the tournament because they didn't have individual events. And then when I came, I recruited some folks. And next thing you know, we were winning, you know, over half the tournaments that we went to because we were, we were, we were, we were sweeping all the oral and Terps, you know, we go one, two, three, or one, two, four, you know, so all of the individual events we were winning as well as the debates the whole time I was there. Was that a uh, Rodney Pete years you were there or? Yeah. Rodney Pete was there when I was there. Yeah, still, still tight I, with him. That's that's why I stopped playing football because Junior say I was playing my position. <laughs> I, got, I got there, I got there, and I watched him run from the locker room to the field, and watched him practice. He never stopped running in spring ball. And I called my mom. I said, "Hey, I'm done." And she goes, "What do you mean?" I said, "I'm done playing football." She goes, "Why?" I said, "They got this Samoan dude. He's bigger, taller, stronger, prettier." I said, I said I can't <laughs> do "I'm gonna be on the bench." <laughs> oh, so you were, you were, you tried out for the football team? No, I, I went out and watched. And well, he looked and said, "No and, thanks." And that was but, it. I was like, he you know, clearly he was trying to get to the next level. I just wanted to play a game. <laughs> wow, that's awesome, man. Uh, Hey, Mark, this has been great, man. We really appreciate the time. And I'm just curious, like, have you ever flown from JFK to Honolulu? No, that would be a terrible flight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've flown from, from Maui to D.C. Oh, wow. Ah, not the same, not the same. And that's a terrible flight, too. <laughs> Cool. Uh, and Mark, I guess, what, what are you up to these days? I know you're doing a lot of stand-up, a lot of good stuff out there. Anything you want to tell our fans? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing stand-up. I'm writing some stuff, trying to get some stuff done. I did uh, four episodes of a eight pilot season, eight, eight episode pilot season for Tyler Perry. Oh, cool. uh, a show called All the Queen's Men. Um, you know, we can't really talk about it because <laughs> they haven't given me the okay yet. But, right, right. Uh, but but hopefully that show will get picked up and you know we'll be off to the races again. Awesome. And I'll tell you one thing: that studio that Tyler Perry built over there is awesome. It's it's uh, it's a major motion picture studio. It's built on uh, this army base and uh, has twelve sound stages. It has a, a White House that is to eighty percent scale. It has what? back lots. They're still building some back lot stuff there. So there's all these different neighborhoods. Um, there's housing on the base. So like when I was there working, they, they put me up in a house that that uh, officers used to live in. Uh, oh, I was right cool there. Oh, it's just fantastic idea. And so so uh, the work was in a bubble, a COVID bubble. I mean, a quarantine bubble. It was it, it was serious. It's like they give you a test the day after they hire you. And then you test again three days before you fly. They fly you out, you know, privately, and then they bring you back, back home. But once you get there, you you go in, you take a test before you enter the studio. Like right as you're in the parking structure, mm. you go to your your house. You stay there for four hours. They uh, bring you food and stuff. And then uh, after four hours, all the tests are back. So then they open up camp, and you can move around freely. And then um, your temperature's taken every morning, and then every four days you get another test. 
And by the time you leave, you know, you've been tested so much that your, your nose feels like a whore. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff man, Hardcore, man. We, uh, that's awesome man good luck with that i hope that i hope the tyler perry thing pans out that's awesome man me too it, it's actually it's actually a really different show it's like it's like it's it's you've never seen a tv show that dealt with this before oh nice yeah so it's gonna nice. be fun nice tease yeah very cool Awesome, wow. Mark. Uh, well, listen, you look great. We're glad you're healthy and we're glad things are on the, the up and up. We, uh, thank you so much, man. It's a real treat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This Thanks for having fun. me, man. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks, Mark. All right, you guys take care. All right, take it easy, man. Thank Stay you. Stay happy and healthy and safe. You too. You too, you bud. Too. All right, peace.